call to order this meeting of the Select Board on August 1st, 2023 at 6.01 p.m. This meeting is being held in person and or remotely as an alternate means of public access pursuant to Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023 and all other applicable laws temporarily amending certain provisions of the open meeting law. You are hereby advised that this meeting and all communications during this meeting may be recorded by the Town of Hingham in accordance with the open meeting law. If any participant wishes to record this meeting, please notify the chair at the start of the meeting in accordance with Mass General Law, Chapter 30A, Section 20F, so that the chair may inform all other participants of said recording. And I believe Mr. Kevin Hertel is recording the meeting. Is anyone else recording the meeting? Okay, seeing none. I will note for the record, participating this evening are myself, Liz Klein, Chair, and Joe Fisher. If you're willing and able, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Next on the agenda is approval of minutes. I know we had some last minute changes. You yep. ready? Okay. I am. All right. So I will move to approve the minutes dated July 25th, 2023. Second, roll call vote. Joe? Aye. And I'm an I as well. Passes unanimously. Next on the agenda is a bear update from Hingham's animal control officer, Leslie Badger. Thank you for joining us. Absolutely, I know you've been no quite problem. busy. <laughs> yes, it's been a busy um, 24 hours. Uh, the bear has revisited Hingham. It was here at the beginning of the summer, uh, along with other South Shore towns. Uh, it came back yesterday in the South Hingham area. Um, due to how things went the first time around, not only in Hingham, but in other surrounding towns, we're approaching things a little bit differently um, from the Mass Fish and Game and Environmental Police. Um, so that's why we've kept things a little bit more off of social media. And the reason for that is, um, is because with the first time around, and we're still seeing it, but not as in big numbers, uh, we have people showing up, not only just from the Hingham area, but from areas all over. Um, not only are they show, showing up, they're getting out of their vehicles, they're going on people's property, they're actually trying to walk up to the bear. Um, we've had incidents where it's happened to me personally and other, to officers in other towns where they follow the cruisers. Um, and I know an incident in another town, the cruisers were responding to another call and they had people following them. So um, it was made, um, the policy that unless it is a, a serious safety situation, we're not disclosing um, on social media except for it's in South Hingham or North Hingham uh, instead of the exact location to try and minimize that because not only for the bear safety, our other concern and main concern is for human safety as well. Um, and the fact that we don't want people going into other people's private property and disturbing their peace. It's one thing to have the bear come through it's another thing to have people you don't even know coming through. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not something that we don't want people to know or we're um, not trying to be safe. Um, we care very much. Um, another thing that I am doing, I'm out there. I've been out there pretty much almost 24 seven. Um, and I'm making sure that I try and stay ahead of the bear. Uh, before I came to the meeting, I was at the Scarlet Oak talking to management. So I'm, I'm personally going to, whether it's businesses, restaurants, the schools, talking to SROs, the churches, um, and individual people that I know live on the streets that it's been seen on, I try and get to those ahead of time. And most streets and neighborhoods have neighborhood threads or emails. And they're, they're, um, when I speak to them, they're letting their neighbors know, hey, the ACO is here, this is what's going on. So it's getting out that way mm -hmm. um, versus the whole town on the social media wide. Mm -hmm. um, and we're doing it that way. So like with Scarlet Oak, I let them know. Um, and then that way they have a heads up. It's, it's, it's not at Scarlet Oak, um, but I gave them a heads up. Hey, you know, it, it's within so many miles. I just wanted you to have the heads up. I know you have diners outside. So I make sure they're aware. You can start your planning. I did it last night as well. You can start your planning. Um, that way, if for some reason you do see it and people become concerned, you, you have that plan in place, what you want to do. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can always call us. We'll come right out and help with whatever you need or usher it along. Um, and, and that brings me to the next part. Um, with the bear, again, the environmental police and the mass fishing game 
uh, their policy as of right now is that they feel um, that it is not uncommon for bears to be in Massachusetts. It is new for them to be coming this way, um, but they feel that they should be allowed to coexist, um, that they should be able to move along, um, and that at this time they have no plans to trap and relocate for any reason unless it is a serious, serious threat going on to the bear or to the public. Mm -hmm. And it has to be something that is a serious, serious threat, not just that it's a bear and it's here. Um, and they've made that very clear to us because we've reached out at different times because we're always checking in with, to let them know, hey, the bear's here, this is going on. So they, they have an update and they made it very clear, great, continue what you're doing. Um, and again, if there's a serious, serious threat, then um, we will make plans to do so. But at this time, they have not in any of the towns uh, made an attempt to trap, relocate, or anything like that. Um, so they have no plans as of yet, unless, again, we have a, a serious situation that mm -hmm. comes up. The most important things that I try and stress to people, and we'll try and get more educational stuff out, um, is again, bird feeders, compost piles, gardens, fruit trees. Uh, those are the things that attract bears. They, everyone thinks of meat bears, they're gonna wanna attack, they're, they wanna eat meat. Black bears, that's, meat isn't really their thing. They like fish, they like crabs, and as I, I stated, the fruit trees, compost piles, those are the things that they like. They don't really go for meat. Um, they are not known, black bears are not known to want to attack anyone unless they are threatened and cornered uh, and they have no way to escape or they have young with them is the only time that I've been made aware of by mass fishing game that they will turn, stand up, roar, uh, and try and advance towards. But as long as enough space is given, um, they keep their distance and they just continue. And that's what's been happening all over the South Shore for this last month and a half that the bears have been in on the South Shore and so far in Hingham. Um, they have been um, just kind of, or this one has been just moseying around mm -hmm. um, and, and not bothering anyone. It has taken a dip in a pool today. Um, I was out there really quickly with the fellow officers. Thank you. Um, and I made the decision, um, no one was outside I, I do want to clear up because there was different rumors. No one was outside. No one was in the pool. It was a quiet backyard. There were children that were home alone, but they were safe. They were of ages that they could be home alone. They were never in any kind of threat. It never went up to the house. It came over the fence, and it went right into the pool and, and was swimming around, having a great time. It even was courteous to pull the pool filter out, um, and then it decided to go for another dip after it did that. Um, but as soon as I walked out, I made my, my presence known. I walked out and, and yelled to it and immediately realized I was there and then I started clapping my hands and yelling. It got right out of the pool and it went the opposite direction of me and it took off and went over the fence and back out of the yard and then continued on. And each time I've seen it, it has continued to want to stay away from me. It has had no interest in, want, in me to be near it or anything to do with it. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I do not at this time, nor does environmental um, or any of the other ACOs that I've been working hand in hand with, because we're all in communication with each other, mm -hmm. um, following where it goes, have had any concerns of it being a threat to any of the public safety at this time. Excellent. So hopefully that thank answers you. questions. If yes. you have any others, feel free. Yes. Well, thank you. Answer them. Thank you so much for all you've done to keep us safe. Absolutely. Um, what should people do if they see the bear on their property? That's a great question. So the, the first and foremost, you see the bear. Feel free, it's totally okay to enjoy that moment, let it pass through, keep your distance, stay in your house. Um, that's the best thing, there's no need to interact with it, there's no need to go outside with it, just leave it be, keep the distance, and it's probably gonna move on fairly quickly. If there's a food source in your yard, you can bang on the window, yell, scream to get it to, to continue to move on, so that way it doesn't um, want to stay there too long or remember that place and want to come back if it's in search of food and staying nearby. Um, so those are important things to do. Again, uh, people are more than welcome. If it is the, a sighting and they want us to know, they can call our business line anytime. I will come out or an officer if I'm not available. We'll come out, we'll check the area, make sure everything's okay, alert people. Um, and let them know what's, what's going on. Otherwise, if it's an emergency that they feel there's a threat, they call 911 okay. and we'll come out immediately. Uh, and we try and stay on top of that. Like I said, if we know it's going uh, near school within certain miles um, of a school, I'm, I'm calling right away. I'm letting, like I said, letting businesses know if I see people out jogging. Um, I had a mom walking an infant with a stroller. I, I walked with her all the way home. 
um, and made sure they got home safely. Um, and then about 30 minutes later, the bear came through their yard. So, okay. um, and they were on Main Street. So um, I am proactively trying to make sure um, that I speak to anyone, everyone that's out there. So we're not by any means not telling people and just like, yeah, whatever. Mm -hmm. We're trying to do it as the state is asking us to a little bit quieter and keeping to that select area it is in. Okay. But again, if it's truly a threat, we will make it uh, uh, everyone aware at that sure. point. Excellent. Have you been communicating with Linden Ponds or any of the senior living facilities? Yes. So yesterday we thought there was a chance um, that it may go to Linden Ponds or a Black Rock community. Mm -hmm. um, so we made sure to reach out to them right away. Their security teams knew. They put out general emails to all the residents. Great. So a lot of them were reaching out to me and I had um, did pass throughs myself yesterday evening just to make sure everything was okay. But then it changed its direction. Um, and now um, has gone a completely different route, so it's it's not near that area okay. at the moment. Excellent, thank you. You're welcome. Joe, do you have any questions? I, I do have a couple questions. Um, do you know how old the bear is? Because it might not qualify for Linden Pond. <laughs> <laughs> he definitely, does. he or she. We've been saying he because this everything it's doing is very characteristic of a male bear. Yep. Um, and we believe this is a male bear that's a juvenile. So it could be anywhere from a year up to two, possibly three years old, but we're uh, at this point feeling, um, talking with the different ACOs and environmental police and uh, mass fishing game, we think it's between a year to two years old. And you mentioned a phone number should, people should call, not the 911, but for you. If what, they want to call is, is that number? the non-business line, yeah. that is the 781-749-1212. Um, yep. One, two, one, two. Okay. And then Any they, particular extension, or are they just? Uh, they, all they, they can hit option zero. Okay. And that will get right to the dispatchers. Um, but again, if they feel it is life-threatening, um, they, they can call 911, um, and that will get to us just as quickly. Um, and any guidance for residents who have pets, particularly dogs or, or cats? Um, so that is another great question. Um, as of right now, knock on wood, uh, I have had no community that has, um, talking to the other ACOs, have had any issues. Cohasset did have an interaction where it was a Great Pyrenees and the bear, and the bear just stood there, and the Great Pyrenees was barking, and its tail was wagging, and it was getting closer and closer, and the bear just stood there and looked at it like, I don't have any interest in wanting <laughs> to have anything to do with you. Yeah. So even though that happened, and the reason I'm bringing that up is, thank goodness nothing happened, but I do not encourage um, that anyone allow their dogs to have an interaction. Thankfully, the bear is very calm and docile and has been that way, but in the off chance one dog gets right on top of or interacts with or tries to go after, the bear is gonna react. So the best thing you can do is make sure you're always watching your pet if you're taking them out to go to the bathroom, um, and you aren't, and you check the area, and you see there's nothing there. If the, if their dog or cat's able to go out of your sight, just make sure you can kind of keep it in your sight, or like a long line, something like that. If you know um, that if your neighbors have told you or me, you, you've seen me in the area, um, that it's in the area, just to make sure to do that to clear your whole yard before you let them out, so they don't have that close interaction. But other than that, they've been. Um, it has not had any actual interaction, and they normally don't because they're not really interested in wanting to attack and eat meat. Um, so that interaction, like the concerns we'd have with a coyote. Sure. Um, it, it's completely different, believe it or not, with a, a black bear. If we had grizzly bears, then there would be more of a concern in that sense. Um, also, uh, another note of mention, a couple other towns have had chicken coops, and it's only gone for the grain. Um, and it has avoided the chickens, and the chickens have been free roaming. There's been turkeys in yards, and it's walked literally right through the whole group of them. Um, didn't even care, didn't stop to look at them, just moseyed on, ate some of the grain, and, and continued on. Same thing with um, barns. The barns in Hingham are aware. I've let them all know. The other towns have reported the same thing. They've either, he's either just, he or she has either just passed through, or if um, grain was left out or some fruit, uh, it would just eat the grain or fruit, never have gone near the animals, and just continued on. Do you have a schedule of sporting events that are going on in town so that you can alert the, the teams? So I do not, but what I've been doing is reaching out to SROs, okay. the school staff directly, um, and they've been keeping me uh, updated on what events are happening on the school fields in that those areas. So I've been checking in with those, but I will check in with um, like private sports team too that may not get the information from um, the schools themselves. So Tom, who, 
who would be the best person for fields? Because it wouldn't necessarily be the schools. Yeah, Mark Thoreau, oh. the rec department, okay. will have con con connections with all the different private sport or athletic Perfect. agencies. Yep. Awesome. And do you, is it your practice that you'll let um, neighborhoods know if the bears in the area so that yes. we'll be on guard for our pets, for example? Oh, yes. Okay. So I, I've made the point to go, so like today and yesterday, I've been in the neighborhoods patrolling all around. Anyone I see out, whether it's someone doing work on someone's house, someone jogging, or it's someone that I, I may or may not know, but I see them there in the backyard. I'm stopping. I'm saying, hey, how are you? What's going on? I just wanted to let you know there's a bear. Feel free to pass it on to your neighbors. We're kind of keeping it a little bit quieter because we've had some people. And then they'd see a couple carloads go by me. And I'm like, and, and there you go. Because they'd stop, roll down the window and say, is the bear here? And I'm like, nope, it's not. You know, you continue on. So, um, yep. How, and how long has the bear been in Hingham? Uh, it's been about 24 hours now. So it arrived yesterday. Um, late morning, early afternoon. Um, so it's been here about 24 hours. Great, thank you. No other questions. Excellent, thank you. You're welcome. Um, any questions or comments from members of the public? I don't see anybody, do you, Michelle? Okay, all right, thank I you. I see a bear raising their hand. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you, Leslie. You're we appreciate welcome. you thank being you. here. Absolutely. No problem, I hope you have a great evening. Thanks, Leslie. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, next on the agenda is to consider approval of the request of Bertucci's Restaurants LLC, 90 Derby Street, for a change of manager. We have Sandro De Cruz with us. I don't see them. Let's see. <laughs> Two other folks just dropped off, and I don't see. Okay. Are we first expecting first? them here? Or we're, yes. we're, we were, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, Should we move on? Yeah, I'll ask Okay, you. all right, we'll come back to that. All right, next on the agenda is the Proclamation for Veteran Suicide Awareness and Remembrance Day. We have Keith German, if you want to join us. And I believe we have Kevin Hertel, the founder of the SAR Flag Corporation, with us on Zoom. Yes, thank you for joining. Thank you. Keith, did you want to start off? Sure thing, thank you. Um, I'll be speaking tonight as um, your Director of Veteran Services as well as the Regional Director for the SAR Flag Incorporated. SAR stands for Suicide Awareness and Remembrance. So um, I wanna thank you, Madam Chair, and the other members of the board and the current uh, administration to, that took this bold step, this very courageous act to help us facilitate the proclamation of uh, suicide, National Suicide Awareness and Remembrance Day, um, which is currently targeted for September 22nd. Um, our hope and goal is to um, have this made a national uh, day of recognition. This is a grassroots uh, evolution. And why did I say you're courageous is because by starting here, as we know, Massachusetts leads the nation in the delivery of military and veterans benefits. And we're number one, and Hingham usually runs around the you know, the top 10 of things that go on, for instance, our POW MIA chair, uh, numerous other things that we've done as far as um, having legislation put forward to the great and general court. So by us acting, our uh, members up on the Hill, Senator O'Connor, uh, Joe Moschino, our representative, we're hoping to then have the other uh, cities and towns, the other 350 fall in line and eventually have this on Governor Healy's desk for signature possibly as early as next year. So uh, again, uh, greatly uh, appreciative of you for doing this. Um, conversely, deeply, deeply disappointed that the school committee chair and the superintendent did not take the similar action when asked to put this on their agenda. Um, why do I say that I'm deeply disappointed? Um, suicide is preventable. You don't have to be in the military or be a veteran. Um, so it's a nationwide issue. It's actually a nationwide epidemic for men and women uh, who have served or are in the military um, post 9-11. Approximately 8,000 deaths occurred in combat during the global war on terrorism and as many as four times as much, so close to 30,000 suicides have also plagued us during that same time. So four times as many men and women who perhaps fought in those battles um, have chosen to take their own lives uh, instead of 
perhaps uh, getting the help that they so readily earned. So um, with that said, I'd, I'd like to um, just turn it over to Kevin, who is the president of the corporation, and let him speak, if that's okay, with the board. Yes, please. Yes, please go ahead, Kevin. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for inviting me here today. Uh, I'm here in support of the proposed proclamation for the annual observance of Veteran Suicide Awareness and Remembrance Day. My name is Kevin W. Hertel. I'm an Air Force veteran and I served during 9 11 as an F 16 crew chief. I'm the founder and president of the nonprofit named the Veterans Suicide Awareness and Remembrance Flag Corporation, but we call ourselves the SAR Flag Family. I'm the creator of the Suicide Awareness and Remembrance Flag, or SAR Flag, and originator of the observance name Veterans Suicide Awareness and Remembrance Day. My cousin, Senior Army Robert Dean, U.S. Air Force, died by suicide in 2016, and it was at that time I became painfully aware of the 22 a day. So I set out to find out why this was happening to our veterans in the military and what I could do about it. I then spent days, then months, then years, reading and researching military and veteran suicide. In my research, I found that there are nonprofits across the country doing God's work to not only serve, but to save our veterans in the military, yet these suicides persist. I read that there are awareness campaigns and more, like the buddy check, yet these suicides persist. I read that there was a 24-hour crisis lifeline, yet these suicides persist. These suicides persist because of the way in which we were trained in the military to downplay, dismiss, or diminish our mental health, thereby creating a stigma associated with it. That's when I decided to create a symbol to break the stigma, to unite nonprofits across our nation working to combat veteran and military suicide, to honor and forever remember those lost to suicide, to change our perception, and to respect, honor, and unite their families. After a year of working on the design, that symbol became the Suicide Awareness and Remembrance Flag, or SAR flag. The SAR flag has been copyrighted at the Library of Congress and now is in 38 states with veterans, families, VFWs, American Legions, and more. Suicide is the number one killer of veterans and military. We will lose more in one year to suicide than all of the casualties from Iraq and Afghanistan combined. The worst part of this loss is that according to the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, most if not all suicides are preventable. There are nonprofits and government entities across our nation working to combat this epidemic. However, their services are vastly underutilized. <coughs> this is due to the stigma that exists with mental health, suicide, and seeking treatment within our warrior culture that prevents those who are struggling from seeking treatment, which leads to a crisis, which then leads to death by suicide. And this is what happened a little over a year ago to one of Hingham's own, Sergeant Matthew Parkinson, United States Marine Corps. The mission of the SAR flag family is to break the stigma of mental health, suicide, and seeking treatment to facilitate prevention. The ways we do this is via public outreach, SAR flag raising at DSOs, presenting SAR flags to families who have lost, and conducting remembrance ceremonies to return honor to the life and service of our nation's warriors and defenders who died by suicide, and to remember those lost, and to unite their families who are currently ignored and forgotten by our country because of the way in which their family member died. We will be conducting a remembrance ceremony this Sunday in Hingham for Sergeant Parkika, and we invite you all to attend. Veterans Suicide Awareness and Remembrance Day is a day to recognize, remember, and honor the veterans and military who died by suicide, as well as to honor, respect, and unite their families. It is a day to forever remember their lives and service to our nation. By having an annual observance, we elevate this issue in the public consciousness and raise our continued awareness. This encourages discussion about veteran suicide, thereby breaking the stigma associated with it. And by changing the perception and normalizing an otherwise taboo subject of mental health among veterans and active military, we allow them to seek out the treatment they need without fear of judgment while simultaneously showing that we care as a state and nation to prevent living veterans and active military from dying by suicide. Veterans and active military continue to be at the greatest risk to die by suicide among the U.S. population. They are two times as likely to die by suicide compared to their civilian counterparts, and an average of 20 plus veterans and active military die by suicide each day in the United States. We have lost over 100,000 to suicide since 2001. Suicide prevention services are vastly underutilized by veterans and military, and this is due to the stigma of mental health, suicide, and seeking treatment. Of the eligible veterans for VA health services, less than half use them. And of those who use them, even fewer seek out mental health services. 
We also know that even fewer active militaries seek out mental health treatment for suicide prevention services. Raising our continued awareness and breaking the stigma of suicide and mental health are key steps to preventing this unnecessary loss of life. That is why we call on the town of Hingham to pass the proclamation to observe Veterans Suicide Awareness and Remembrance Day so that we can honor and remember those lost to change the perception, to raise our continued awareness so that we can come together to prevent other families like mine or the Partika family from having to endure such a terrible loss. Please go to sarfly.org to learn more about our mission and to support us in our endeavor to end veteran and military suicide. And I would like to now leave you with our motto. We honor, we remember, we will end veteran suicide together. Thank you for allowing me to speak here tonight. Well, thank you. That was quite, quite powerful. Thank you for your service. Um, and I'm so sorry for the loss of, of your cousin. Um, thank you for joining tonight and, and certainly your dedication um, and passion for this, this tragic cause. And Keith, thank you again for bringing this up, um, bringing it to our attention. You have been, a, I'm sure you've had interactions with and have had the opportunity to work with Keith. He is a tremendous advocate for our veterans. Um, and this is a, a certainly a, a cause that we are all very passionate about. Um, and as you mentioned, it's not just a national um, epidemic, but it has reached our community and, and we're feeling it quite deeply. So, so thank you. Um, I am glad that we are leaders in this. Um, I am certainly passionate about breaking down the stigma of, of mental health. Um, I, it's certainly something we are committed to as a board. Um, and are working not only with veterans, but um, with all of our community members as best we can. So certainly um, support this and um, you know, look forward to what the next steps are to get it in front of uh, Governor Healy. Joe, do you have any comments? Um, just to add my voice to yours, the, the stigma associated with mental health and suicide issues is not limited to the military. Um, but I think you're leading the way, and by attempting to break the stigma, you'll help others, not limit it to the military. Keith, could you comment a little bit about what events will be happening this weekend? Sure. Um, this Sunday on August 6th at the Hingham Harbor Bandstand um, at 11 a.m., we will be holding the SAR, nine, what we call the 922 ceremony. And it will be in honor of the one year anniversary, which was as close as we could get it to avoid the holiday in, in July um, for the Partika family. They will be escorted down 228 by a uh, motorcycle procession, as was similar to when we brought Matthew home last year. Um, they'll proceed down uh, Main Street to North, I think, and then over to um, Hingham Harbor, where um, the Patikas will be met by members of the SAR team. Um, there'll be a, a brief um, exchange of you know, uh, salutations, and then they'll be brought up onto the bandstand. Uh, we also have, uh, in our, to grace our presence, uh, the singing trooper, for all those who may know Sergeant Dan Clark. He's a pretty well-known uh, person around these parts. Um, he'll be singing our national anthem and Marine Corps hymn. There'll be um, a prayer by Colonel uh, Philip Anderson um, in Matthew's uh, honor as well as some spoken words um, from our Brigadier General uh, who will be gracing our presence as well. He is what, he is the, I guess he's the kind of the, he's the face behind what we call Tough Rock. And for those of you who don't know, Tough Rock is a, uh, a course where uh, anybody can participate. You fill a rucksack, so a backpack with about 30 pounds, and you go the distance, <laughs> and if you can. And uh, it's just to show, again, bring out that awareness to the, um, the national epidemic, which at its height was at 22 uh, veterans and military members a day, is now around, they say, 17 and a half, the VA says. But, um, so that ceremony will be from 11 to 12 um, down at the harbor. Everyone, the public is, is more than welcome. Uh, afterwards, for those who are in the procession and the uh, participants, will be a luncheon up at the Grand Army uh, of the Republic Memorial Hall from 1230 to 2. 
Right. So members of the public who want to participate should show up a little before. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. Should we read the proclamation? Yeah, do you want me to do the first three or four? Um, why don't you do the first four, then I'll finish. Okay. Town of Hingham, Veterans Suicide Awareness and Remembrance Day. Whereas the Town of Hingham, Massachusetts, recognizes the importance of honoring and supporting our brave veterans and military members who have selflessly served our nation with valor and dedication. And whereas it is with great concern that we acknowledge the alarming issue of veteran and military suicide, a deeply troubling and preventable tragedy that affects the lives of countless veterans, military members, and their families. And whereas it is our duty as a compassionate community to raise awareness about the mental health challenges faced by veterans and military members, including post-traumatic stress, depression, anxiety, and other related conditions that contribute to the issue of veteran and military suicide. And whereas the Town of Hingham seeks to elevate this issue in the public consciousness and raise our continued awareness, which promotes open dialogue and understanding about mental health issues among veterans and military members, breaks down the stigma surrounding seeking help, and ensures that our veterans and military members have access to the necessary resources and support without judgment. And whereas it is essential that we remember and honor those brave men and women who have tragically lost their lives to suicide, while expressing our unwavering commitment as a community, state, and nation to preventing further loss of life. And whereas we call upon all residents, businesses, schools, and community organizations to join together on this day to raise awareness about the mental health challenges faced by veterans and military members and to commemorate those service members who have lost their lives to suicide. Now therefore, we, Elizabeth F. Klein, Joseph M. Fisher, and William C. Ramsey, Select Board of the Town of Hingham, do hereby proclaim September 22nd, 2023, as Veterans Suicide Awareness and Remembrance Day in Hingham, signed this first day of August, 2023. Signed by Elizabeth F. Klein Chair, Joseph M. Fisher, and William C. Ramsey. So with that, I move to proclaim Friday, September 22nd, 2023, as Veterans Suicide Awareness and Remembrance Day in the town of Hingham. Second, roll call vote. Joe? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. It passes unanimously. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you, Madam Chair. I have, um, so those of you who know me, when I usually come before you, I give you the bluff, right? The bottom line up front. So now I have what they call the alibi. So I've forgotten something and I need to add it. <laughs> so um, I see that our police chief Jones is, is here in the audience tonight. For those of you who don't know, tonight is what they call National Night Out. And I wanted to thank him for inviting us, meaning myself, the veterans, and the VA. So the VA from Boston are out back, along with many other uh, vendors and, and police demonstrations. But it was at, I think, the bequest of this board, and then brought to fruition through, through Tom, Michelle, and Art, to set up the Hingham uh, Wellness Coalition. So we are out there as well tonight. Uh, in the public, along with our partners in the VA, who, who kind of have the reins on this. And Joe was kind of right. It isn't, a, it isn't uh, just a military or veteran uh, epidemic. It's a nationwide epidemic for everybody. And um, the VA just knows how to do it. They're doing it now. So they're kind of the role model for it. So we're out there with them, partnering with them tonight, and um, helping to break down that stigma just right outside behind this, this building right now tonight. So I thank you all for for being that brave and, and you know, saying the words, because it's only when we say it out loud that we, yep. that we can put it to bed. Agreed. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Let's Thank go. you, Kevin. Thank you. Oh. Oh. Are there any um, questions or comments from members of the public? I should have said that before we voted. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay, next on the agenda is to proclaim August 12th, 2023 as Farmer's Market Day in the town of Hingham. And we have Mark Collings joining us. Hello. That's a hard act to follow. <laughs> um, Kevin and Keith, um, listen carefully. Um, um, 
it's happenstance that I'd be here tonight to hear this, but it uh, is, it's a moving uh, tribute to people who have experienced the loss. Yes. Uh, I'm Mark Cullings, 44 Spring Street. Um, one of the people who helps run the market, and uh, it is, uh, next week is Farmer's Market Week nationally, <coughs> and uh, as I've been here um, a number of years previously, uh, I'm requesting that Hingham proclaim um, the ne a week from Saturday as Hingham Farmer's Market Day, um, just to give you a, a, a little brief on the market. It's never been better. Uh, okay. It is... Um, we are in the correct place, <laughs> and Tom, you helped Joe. You know, uh, has you all have been uh, terrifically supportive, and um, the, the Station Street parking lot is where the market existed for I don't know how many years. It was registered with the Commonwealth in 1977, so we know that date uh, as a matter of record. <clears throat> I have a poster that was given to me that someone found in an antique shop that is clear, clearly long before 1977. So, and the market has been uh, on Station Street for that long. So we're, uh, we're back and um, rocking. Uh, we're seeing uh, between, uh, we're, we don't do a hard count. We don't, we don't know exactly how many people come every week and it's um, weather dependent of course seasonally dependent uh, right now we're uh, Saturday will be our 14th market of the season so that puts us just about halfway through everything's in corn uh, blueberries uh, tomatoes are, are are coming out of our, our ears and the, the people at the at the start of the market at 9 a.m. Um, we can have as many as 90 people uh, lined up for the opening bell to come in and, uh, and see our vendors and take advantage of local produce and locally produced products. Um, so we're, we're quite proud, and, um, uh, but it would not be for in existence without the support of the town. And um, Chief Jones, um, uh, you uh, and your, your staff uh, have been uh, essential to this too. Uh, occasionally, we do have a car parked in the parking lot, and the the, <laughs> the dispatchers are are kind and patient. But they and they we do try to um, uh, get the cars out of the footprint. Um, there, we've had a couple of incidents of vandalism of the of the portable toilet, mm -hmm. um, but uh, they've been minor, and uh, so uh, we're in good shape. But uh, that's that's about it. But it's been uh, it's. We're, as I say, we're very proud of the market, and we're glad to be able to be here. Excellent. Well, you should be proud of the market. It's uh, I love being there, seeing all the people and all the vendors, and it's a lot more than just produce. <laughs> no, it's the community. And fish and, and chocolate and mead wine and yes. lots of <laughs> fun <laughs> additions this year, too. So thank you for continuing it. I know it's a lot of work and a lot of organization it, uh, to pull As I've that told off. many, many people, um, I get far more from it than I put in. Cool. Thank you. Thank you for all you do. Do you have any questions, Joe? Um, what is the schedule? How long will it be open at uh, Station Street? Uh, the market is open uh, until the last Saturday before Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. And then we'll take a month off and uh, expect to go back to uh, Wampatuck State Park in January, February, and March. Uh, and I'm already making plans, but I just filed for the application. It's August. Yeah. <laughs> well, we, we gotta stay Where is yep. summer going? Right, right. So it really is um, a major contributor to the community. So we do appreciate all, your, all the work that you've done. Thank you. thank you. Yes, thank you. Supporting our local farmers, local businesses, um, and just seeing the community come together is, is so much fun. Um, and often there's live music, and it, it really is a nice community event. Yeah. We, um, we, um, we love seeing families, and we see them from all over the region, which yeah. is uh, lovely. Um, I, I, just a, um, a couple of more things I'll... Uh, partly off of Keith that uh, that I didn't mention. We have a very active SNAP program, mm -hmm. uh, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, the, the federal program that uh, supplanted food stamps. And thanks to a grant from the Fruit Center Marketplace, we are able to offer a, a generous um, 
uh, grant. They gave us a generous grant that allows us uh, to boost the ability of, of people who are SNAP participants uh, to increase their purchasing power at the market. We're very proud of that, and, uh, and we've seen it grow um, through uh, the last several years. It's a very robust program uh, now. And uh, Hingham Institution for Savings has also been a, an annual supporter, uh, helping to underwrite the, underwrite the, uh, uh, the fundamental costs of the market and keep our vendor fees low. So Excellent. I did want to you know, give them a shout out yes. in that program. Yes, thank you. Yes, the SNAP program is wonderful. Mm -hmm. Um, and certainly, thank you to the Fruit Center and Hingham Institute for Savings. Um, they've been great supporters, I know. Um, any questions or comments from members of the public? All right, do you wanna? We'll do the same. Yep, yeah. okay, start us off here. Town of Hingham, Massachusetts proclamation. Whereas Her, Excell Her Excellency, Governor Mara T. Healy of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts has proclaimed August 6th to 12th 2023 to be Massachusetts Farmers Market Week. And whereas farmers markets are essential to the vitality of Massachusetts farms and are part of the cultural tradition of the Commonwealth. And whereas the Commonwealth is home of 216 summer fall farmers markets, which create a festive open air setting, which enhances community spirit and civic pride by offering a natural place for community gathering. And whereas farmers markets help heighten public awareness of the agricultural diversity of Massachusetts and the benefits of buying local and preserving open space. And whereas it is befitting for the citizens of Hingham to recognize the continued contribution of farmers markets to local consumers, as well as their positive impact on the economy of the Commonwealth. And whereas Hingham's tradition of its farmers market now in its 45th season makes it the third oldest in the Commonwealth. Now, therefore, we, Elizabeth F. Klein, Joseph M. Fisher, and William C. Ramsey, Select Board of Hingham, do hereby proclaim August 12, 2023, to be Hingham Farmers Market Day, and urge all citizens to take cognizance of this event and participate fittingly in its observance. Dated this first day of August 2023, signed Elizabeth F. Klein Chair, Joseph M. Fisher, and William C. Ramsey. I move to, pro to proclaim Saturday, August 12th, 2023, as Farmer's Market Day in the town of Hingham. Second. Roll call vote. Joe? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. Passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle, here's our rent check. <laughs> <laughs> Very Month efficient. Of <laughs> Thank you. Delivered in person. Love it. Thank you. Thanks, well played. Um, do we have a blue two cheese person? No. Okay. All right, next on the agenda is the Public Safety Facility Project Update. See, we uh, have, I'll, I'll, you I'll wanna kick, kick us off? off? If you don't okay, mind. Yep. sure. Excuse me, Michelle, can you contact the uh, Bertucci's? Sharon already has, she's, oh, okay. talk, she's contacting him and their supervisor. I'm not sure someone's gonna be able to join us this evening. Okay. Okay, sorry. So, so we'll just uh, a couple of quick comments and then we'll get into it. So the public safety facility project is moving right along. Um, a lot of great progress. I like driving by it every day and seeing the uh, yet new progress. So um, we'll be in there, I think, before we know it. Uh, we did assemble our team here tonight. We have um, a number of folks from, uh, from staff and from the committees and contracted companies, et cetera. So from the building committee tonight, we have Bob Garrity and Donna Smallwood here. Um, our staff, we have J.R. Fry and Chief Murphy. Chief Jones just had to step out to go meet with the DA downstairs. Um, but they're here uh, also to, to answer questions as needed. And from Hill International, our owner's project management team, we have Paul Callis and Matt Hennessy. Um, before we uh, turn it over to Paul and Matt to walk us through the progress on site, I've asked um, uh, Bob Garrity to give us a, an overview of the committee and their role and what they do. Bob? Uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I assume you can hear me okay. I'm on vacation. I'm okay, so <laughs> this is a first. Uh, the, uh, this is our first project update meeting with the select board. I believe we'll probably be having them quarterly or as necessary uh, as the project goes along. So uh, congratulations, everybody. This is the first project meeting 
since the construction contract has been awarded. Mm -hmm. uh, so as Paul indicated, the, the project team from the owners, the owners project management team is um, Hill International. They're, they're uh, comprised, well, they comprise a lot of people, but key people who are here tonight, who you'll be hearing from in a moment, uh, is Paul Callis and Matt Hennessy. Uh, Matt is the uh, project engineer who's the resident engineer. We typically uh, call Matt, so he's there every day. Uh, the design team is KBA, and KBA's uh, primary uh, contact, primary, primary architect of the project uh, is Sean Schmiegel. Uh, so, so the construction contract was awarded to Collins Home Owners uh, several months ago. Uh, the contract amount is $39,483,840. Uh, now, the, uh, the, a real quick overview of the construction, uh, where the construction uh, commenced and when it will likely be done. Uh, the construction contract started, start date for that project, for the contract, is May 15th, 2023. The substantial completion date is scheduled for January 14th, 2025. Uh, and the final completion date so substantial completion is usually the date that uh, you can it, you take over use and occupancy and you move into the project. The final completion of the contract is scheduled for March 26, 2025. Uh, it typically takes about 60 days, if you're lucky, uh, to be able to um, uh, close out a project after you take over substantial completion. Uh, now, a couple of items on uh, the construction work that has been underway for the last, uh, say, six weeks or so, uh, a, or is currently is cur either currently completed or currently underway. Uh, the uh, contractor, you know, with the assistance of the OPM and the architect, uh, has secured the contract site. They're laying out all the work. Uh, the the it's, it's been an installation of work trailers, fencing, temporary utilities. Uh, the demolition of the wood building that had been on site for a number of years has been completed. It's no longer there. The demolition of the concrete slab and foundation wall uh, is underway as we speak. Uh, as you'll probably recall, if you're familiar with the site, about probably about 60% of the entire site is covered by a uh, concrete slab. Uh, that had a very large building on it from World War II days. Uh, so that slab has to be uh, torn out, crushed up. Uh, they separate the steel rebar from the concrete uh, for the purposes of uh, trucking it off the site. Uh, and there are also foundation walls that support the concrete slab. They go pretty deep, and they are, they are also part of the demolition experts. It's, it, uh, demolition work that's currently underway. Uh, we're, we uh, confirmed the, uh, the utility connections we need for the building, a number of the, the um, installation of utilities is ongoing as we speak. Uh, the contractor and all their different subcontractors uh, have been, uh, are already well along in submitting shop drawings uh, to the architect, well, what shop drawings are is basically the contractor and their suppliers uh, tell us what, well, tell the architect how they are going to perform the detailed work that's already spelled out in the design plans. So it really gets into the nuts and bolts of exactly what size everything is going to be, who the manufacturer is going to be. Uh, you know, the hundreds, maybe the thousands of different pieces that they come together on a construction contract. So the contractor and their subs submit shop drawings to the architect. The architect reviews them all with, with their team, uh, all the engineers and architects and their staff, uh, and they review it in accordance with what the con construction contract requires uh, and before anything gets installed. Uh, the architect has to approve uh, the shop drawings that have been submitted uh, by the contractor as being completely compatible with what the construction contract requires. 
the, we've established a, uh, a procedure. We want the, the town will be following uh, to review and approve payment applications uh, from Carl Antonio to ensure that there'll be a timely payment process. Uh, payment on construction contracts uh, is is a, a pretty is a very uh, important aspect of the project, uh, particularly for the contractor. The whole area of payment is regulated by uh, by law, and that law is incorporated into our construction contract. Uh, it every payment to the general contract is monthly pay. Okay, bill general contract is billed as monthly. Uh, the town has to pay, or at least they're obliged to pay under the law, uh, the contract within 15 days on periodic payments. So that's uh, that's hard under any circumstances, let alone when you have a project that we have a building committee that reviews payment requests. Uh, we, we've got the designer, the OPM, uh, town personnel, uh, all I have to review it before you can even get a warrant to put it on. Uh, you, you, where you folks and Tom uh, Mayo have to you basically go through the operations just to get a check cash. So we think we've got a good workable pro uh, process uh, in place. We'll find out soon, seeing that right now we're processing the first payment. Uh, I understand from uh, JR that everything seems to be fine and we're, we're really hoping that we'll be able to meet all the requirements for periodic payments. Tom's office has been a big help on that in that regard uh, and uh, hopefully my committee won't delay anything. The way, the way we set it up, we basically submit the uh, payment request uh, to, well, the payment request gets submitted as uh, what they call a pencil payment a week from the contractor to the architect and the OPM a week before the final payment actually gets submitted. The architect and uh, the OPM review it. They go through every single item. Uh, these payment requisitions are 48 pages long. And every page is, is, uh, has a different payment item on the contract. On top of it, we, hope, we would hold the retainage to make sure we have low paid contract, contract, heaven forbid. And uh, it's a lot of work to put a payment to get, uh, pro together. The process, again, is a payment right requisition goes in pencil form. The architect of the OPM talks to the general contractor when necessary to subs during a weekly period. Then the contractor finalizes each payment request, signs off on it. The architect and the OPM certify that the, the amount that the contractor requests by as uh, revised by the owner and architect if they, they feel it's appropriate. Uh, they certify the amount that's due, and then it goes uh, through the process, and the town retains the statutory amount against each payment so that we don't overpay anybody. Uh, the, uh, let me see. Okay, we, and we got, besides the construction contract, there, is also, there are also another number of aspects of this project that will make it whole at the end of the day, and we have to do work on those aspects of the project already, even though we're really just in the beginning of the construction phase. So what I'm talking about here is uh, there'll be uh, fixtures, FF&E, fixtures, furniture, and equipment. Uh, those will all have to be procured during the course of the next uh, 20 months, really. It, but to, to do that is a whole complicated process where the architect, the OPM, and the police and fire departments both sit down and hash out exactly what they're going to need. Uh, you know, whatever they can delay, or whatever the situation will be, there's a whole process for procuring everything that gets put into the project. Uh, and the architect has already started that. Well, they kickstarted it again. The project, the process to uh, sit down with the uh, the fire department, police department, to make sure uh, that. You know, we're, we've got got everything right, and eventually, probably about a year down the road, we'll, we'll be, or even less, but uh, probably about six months to, to 10 months down the road, we'll actually be going out and starting to procure 
uh, different batches of furnishing, furnishings and equipment. So uh, having said all of that, I'd be happy to turn it over to uh, either Paul Callis or Matt Hennessy, um, and you can take it from here. Thanks, Bob. Um, I'm, my name is Paul Callis. With me tonight is Matthew Hennessy. They're our uh, project manager on site. And we have a slideshow to present. And I'd like to, if we can uh, screen share, we'll put that up. And Matt will lead us into um, the uh, kind of tour of what's been going on over the last couple of months. Excellent. Um, so, Matt, why don't you take it? Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Matt Hennessy. As everyone said, I'm the project manager. I'm on site daily. And I just wanted to continue on with Bob had said. Uh, I want to go through some uh, some photographs, just to just you know to show you what's been done, uh, the next actions, and some photographs to give you a sense of, of the project. And so stop me, anyone, if you have any questions or uh, concerns, or let me know. So this is a construction update. Uh, so as you know, mobilization has been going on. Uh, the fencing, the construction fencing. And the scrim, which is the green netting, uh, is also applied to the fencing. That's the entire perimeter. And that item, as well as the erosion pest control, these are items that are all part of the code, uh, the building code uh, for permitting in the town of Hinkle. So they've been followed to a T. Uh, the erosion control, uh, for those of you who don't know, and forgive me if you do, uh, simply, you know, often water is on the site, and you don't want that water to escape the site. So uh, there is uh, uh, the netting around the perimeter and the interior of the fence with a silt sock, which is a green tube, which is, which is, uh, is absorbent and helps absorb water. It just keeps all the water and, and any materials uh, on site. Uh, pest control has been installed as well. That's around the perimeter as well. To uh, you know, we have fresh market there, so I'm wondering if we'll have anything from them, but we haven't so far. We just tested uh, the, the uh, pest control itself just came out and found that none of the tracks were, were filled. Uh, the removal of the soil, so the topsoil from the project uh, was was taken to the uh, Hangman DPW sto uh, soil storage facility. Successfully, it's all done, it's all there now. Um, as Bob had said, the temporary electrical Panel. Uh, I will say that that moved very smoothly. Uh, often that's a, you know it's it's a, it's a long, arduous process, but because the town was there uh, and a part of this with the you know electrical company, it went really smoothly. Very happy about that. Um, construction trails are in; they're being outfitted as we speak. Um, and again, I, I I put the aggregate stone for dry path, and that is a uh, so you had you. We took up the topsoil and we took up much of the, the asphalt and so the aggregate is stone so that, and you'll see in a later photograph, so that no water um, uh, escapes the site. It's absorbed and goes down to the stone. So removal of former on-site building and its foundation slab. We, we saw the photographs and been talking about that. That was the first big step. Uh, you know, it's a nice, uh, it went smoothly and it's already been done. The foundation itself, everything has, has been generally. Um, and now, as, as uh, Tom was saying, that yeah, the, the, the slab is being removed. It's, as Bob said, it's like 60%. It's a lot. Uh, it's a lot of concrete. It was a you know, military uh, project site from the 40s. Some of, the, some of the, uh, the footings were four foot by four foot by 12 foot. They were enormous. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of concrete. Going well, it will continue to go on. And then, lastly, tree protection has occurred. That's that's an important factor. Uh, a lot of nice trees. Uh, the perimeter of the property and those have been protected. Okay. Great. Next action. Uh, so we'll continue the, the uh, demolition of the slab, uh, the slab and the foundation walls, which are foundation walls slash retaining walls, given the grade of the uh, the project uh, of the of, of the uh, the land there. Continue crushing concrete debris for rebar separation. So what happens is you have a lot, you know, these big pieces of concrete uh, when they are uh, when they are um, 
removed off site, the, the, the rebar has to be separated because they're two different, um, and the rebar is, is recycled. So that's what's going on. It's this big crushing machine and it crushes it all out and picks the, the rebar pieces and there's a lot of it. Um, excavation on north side to access core machine line. So this is one of the next steps as well where uh, there's a lot of um, steam pipe, water pipe, and sewage pipe on the property. Uh, so uh, that and the line below it They'll be, they'll be excavating the top layers and then hand digging around so there's no damage to the water and sewage. And, I, and I'm keeping an eye on that. Uh, it's, a, it's a tough thing because it, a lot of, the, a lot of it, the lines were not documented. Uh, that's not something that was done so much in the past or so carefully as we do today. So there's a lot of uh, you know, unforeseen kind of steam lines. Like their, their locations are, are, are not known, so we have to do that carefully. And then also, that half of that's done, the, the backfill of the former piping uh, removal of those trenches. And then after that, the big, the big step is the beginning of footings and, uh, and the foundation process. And so we're excited about that. Uh, and that is the next big phase uh, for uh, us. Let me show you some photographs. So this photograph captures four different phases. We have, we have the, the green fence. We have the black, uh, black erosion control. We have the green silt sock, and we have the pest control there, the black box. And then we also have the, the tree protection. So actually, it's five, uh, if you'd like. So this is, as I was discussing, this is uh, the Essington entrance and the aggregate there, so that no water, uh, you know, it, when it comes in here, it, it sinks down through the stone and out into the road and brings dust. Construction trailers, that's my trailer, that's where I'll be. <laughs> if you want to stop on by, you'll see I'm right there. Uh, this is the Kent Electrical uh, Station, uh, and, it's, and it is in between two trailers, and it's all done and it's been inspected by the town, which is you know, a good problem to work out well. This is the site of the former building, and uh, that's the, you know, the big pile of debris. Nice building, just a pile of junk garbage now. <laughs> it happens so quickly. Uh, and then and also, this is from a couple weeks ago, or two or weeks ago, and the foundation now is already gone. So. And the asphalt as well. So this is, a, this is an important process here. This is wetting soil to maintain dust control. But as you know, with the, with, with the, we have the winds off the water there. We have a lot of dirt. And then the areas where they didn't put the aggregate down because they can't because it'll be working. Uh, we spray. This is a water truck that just drives around the site and fills. It's filled from the from the fire hydrant in, in the northwest corner, and it just drives around and sprays water to be moist, uh, so that the dust doesn't fly in the air. And this is showing a couple different. Uh, uh, it's what you have here is you have the, the breaking up of the uh, concrete blocks. You have the separation of steam with uh, the rebar, and then you have the spraying to keep the dust down from the breaking of the, of the concrete. And this is jackhammer. So they got a big old jackhammer on the 390 there to, because uh, it's really thick, it's eight inch slab there, very hard, dense concrete. So they had to bring a lot of things to put into that. And this is the demoing uh, of the foundation. This is the, the uh, dumpster, just showing a picture of the dumpster of just the rebar that's been removed from the concrete to be recycled. This is an important uh, process. This is a, a gentleman from a company hired by Paul Antonio, part of their scope and their contract is to document the project monthly. So they, uh, they are a service, they come out, they walk around and photograph the entire site. They, uh, they have a drone as well that captures the, the you know, aerial shots, and so it happens once a month to keep track of all the activity going on. We have a monthly process. And that's in addition to our daily photography that we do it each and every day. Exactly, so I, right, so then as, as those of you uh, who have received my daily reports, I, I take photos every day and produce daily reports, and at the end of weekly reports, uh, and I have photos in there. and and. and Kind of like describing what's in the photograph. This is a gentleman that's just that, that, that keeps a uh, that's calling 
Antonio, uh, hired by Nicole Antonio, as part of the scopes, we just document separately from what we do with that whole thing. Right? Uh, and then all of a sudden, wait, oh, there we are. There's the building. Uh, that's where we'll be, as, as Bob had said. Liz, can I just make? Sure, yes, thank you, Matt. Thank you, Matt. Just a couple of extra comments, I'll be brief. Um, while we demo this site and we look forward to building the new building, I just remind everybody that when we bought this property a few years ago for this purpose, um, we knew at the time that we would be able to utilize the site as was for a period of time until we started this work. And we, and we in fact, did that, I think, pretty well. We, the police department used it on a regular basis for training exercises. Um, the, we held COVID uh, uh, testing clinic on site there, mm -hmm. which was great. And at the, towards the end when we were just about to demo it, uh, Chief Murphy had his team over there and, um, and did some training in terms of uh, how, to, uh, how to deal with a, a home fire. We didn't actually burn the building. It was too close to the, to the market, didn't want to burn the market down. But we, you. Uh, well, you know, it's the least I could do. Um, but we, uh, we decided that uh, it would be a good opportunity for, for the chief to bring, um, to get some training in on the site. I was, it was funny, I went over there at one point and the deputy and one of the captains were down, down below and they were, I see the guys up on the roof swinging the axes and I said, well, who's up there? And they said, nah, it's all the kids. It's <laughs> giving them a chance to swing the axes and cut holes in roofs uh, and do it on a, on a site that was about to be torn down. It was a perfect opportunity. So um, it's, it was a successful purchase. Obviously, it'll be great when we move into the building. But um, yeah, we got, we got some pretty good use out of that site in the last few years too. I do recall the, the COVID testing site. Yeah. And uh, that was very helpful. Yes. Absolutely, two, two versions of it, I think, at one point, yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you, Bob, and, and the committee, um, and Paul and Matt, for bringing us through um, the update. Um, and we look forward to many more updates. Um, but a lot has, has certainly happened since May, so um, it's exciting to see. Um, do you, from your perspective, are we on target from a schedule and budget perspective? Yes. Excellent. And, and I know you, you talked, Bob, about the monthly invoice process. So uh, I'm assuming we're paying for work complete to date on a monthly basis. Is that right? Yes. OK. OK, excellent. Um, the, I know the next big step is the footings and foundation process. What is the timing of that? Sure. Uh, yeah, construction sounds goes, but it, it appears, you know what I mean, so I'll get that. Okay, excellent. Our foundation should be in before winter. Before yeah. winter, uh, okay. Steel during the winter works out pretty well. Okay, excellent, excellent. And have you heard any concerns from abutters so far? No. Excellent. Good, that's good to hear. Thank you. Joe, do you no, have any no, questions? No, really, just thank you for your oversight on the project. Um, Looking forward to uh, the ongoing reports. Thanks. Excellent. Chief, did you want to add anything? No. no? We're very happy. Happy so far? Construction, <laughs> you know, ongoing, and obviously it's a demolition period, but um, we're very happy to see the progress that's being made. Excellent. Excellent. And, uh, just to keep you in the loop, we have weekly meetings. We actually had a meeting this afternoon. Um, it's a combination of on site and virtual. Okay. Um, but, you know, the, all of the Excellent. Um, excellent. Thank you. Any questions or comments from members of the public? I don't know if anybody's with us. Did you want to add anything else? Tom, Joe? Nope, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Excellent. Well, thank you all. We look forward to the next update.
Yes. This is exciting. Thank you all for joining. Have a good vacation. Rest of your vacation, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Bye, everybody. Goodbye. Good night. Thank you. Bye. All right, next on the agenda is FY24 Senior Means Tested Property Tax Exemption Update and Outreach. And I know we have Aaron Walsh and Joshua Ross with us. You can kick us off, Michelle. Sure. Thank you. So as you said, we have Aaron Walsh, our Director of Assessing, and Josh Ross, our new Chair of the Board of Assessors with us. We just wanted to update the select board on our um, outreach campaign for the senior means as a tax exemption. Just as a reminder, this was a new property tax exemption that the town put in place a few years ago. It was created by annual town meeting in 2019. Um, town meeting this year actually extended the, the exemption indefinitely, which we really appreciate. So we're able to offer this exemption now going forward. Um, this took special legislation that passed and it was initially good for three years, but we are now in our third year of implementation in FY24. And I will turn it over to Erin to walk through some of the specifics about who's eligible and who we're targeting in Hingham. Great. All right, so here are some of the eligibility requirements. Um, so uh, for the circuit breaker, you must be 65 or older, or a co-owner must be 60 or older by December 31st of 2022. You must have owned and occupied a residence in Hingham for at least 10 consecutive years. The annual income for calendar year 2022 cannot exceed 64,000 for singles, 80,000 for head of household, and 96,000 for married couples, um, which is up from last year's 62, 78, and 93. The assessed value cannot exceed 912,000, which last year was 884,000. Um, the assets, um, they must not have excessive assets, which is determined by the Board of Assessors, um, and it's sort of determined we didn't want to put a cap on it um, just to be sort of more flexible, um, and it's determined by the pool of applicants who apply. Um, and the most important thing I would say is that you must have claimed the state circuit breaker tax credit on your income tax return for calendar year of 2022. Before you turn the page, if you can just go back. Sure. Uh, residency, must have owned and occupied a residence. Is it the same residence or any residence? In any residence okay, in Hingham, yeah, right. as long as it's been 10 years. Um, so the benefit is it's tied to the Mass State Circuit Breaker Tax Credit. So if you uh, apply on your state taxes, on your state income tax return, and you claim the Circuit Breaker Tax Credit, you would be eligible for this benefit. Um, and what we like to say in the office is if you look at your state income tax return, look on line 44, if there's a dollar amount there, then you know that you would qualify for this. Um, the maximum fiscal year 24 benefit is currently $1,200, which is up from 1170 last year, which is set by the state. Um, and then the board the, of assessors would present the total slate to the select board who would then um, determine the exemption amount anywhere between 50 and 100% of the amount set by the state. So applications are due to the assessor's office by September 1st of 2023, so a month from today. Um, and if you are eligible, the credit will be applied to December of 2023's tax bill. So half would come off on your February 1st bill and half would come off on your May 1st bill. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Josh, who will talk uh, about some participation. Great, thank you. So the first year we did it was fiscal year 2022. We had received 24 applications. Um, we approved 20 of them for a total exemption of 22201, um, which was approved by the select board 100%. So everyone who applied right. who approved um, got that amount. Uh, this past year for fiscal year 2023, uh, we saw a 300% increase, which was amazing, to 96 applicants uh, 86 were approved by the board um, for a total of 88,304, and again, um, which was 100%, was approved by the select board. Mm -hmm. um, to date, we have 40 applicants uh, for fiscal year 24, and 10 of those were new, which is great. Um, and this time last year, we only had 20. So we are well ahead of the, the pace that we were last year. Um, 
Erin and her team does a, a fabulous job um, reaching out, especially for the folks who um, applied last year and uh, were approved to hopefully um, re-up their application. Uh, now that they've done it once or twice, it should be a lot easier process. Mm -hmm. uh, and also they should feel confident in turning over their personal information to us. Um, so um, this last number here, the, t the target is based upon uh, a, f a number that was given to us a couple of years ago by the state on the number of eligible participants, like Erin said, who file for their um, state circuit breaker. So uh, uh, the number, the total number who applied from the state uh, is somewhere in the 430s, um, okay. but that includes renters. So this doesn't include renters in our number. So we estimate around 350 potential. Um, and that's and another differenti differentiator between us and the state is the um, assets. So they may qualify for the state, but may not qualify for Hingham. So we're trying to reach these 350 people. Um, like I said, we did a, a really big campaign last year. I know we presented it last year of everything we did. We're, we're looking to build on that this year. Um, we'll talk about that, what, we're, what we're doing in, in a little bit. But, um, you know, we're hoping to grow uh, that number from 96 this year again to up well over 100. Um, so some of the things that we have done is, like I said, we mailed the applications to the prior applicants um, and do follow-up phone calls, and that's from you know June and August of this year. Uh, if you received your tax bill, you would have received a flyer about the exemptions, because that was in this year's tax bill, which we switched from last year. We did the um, light bill, but mm -hmm. this year, everyone seems to open their tax bill more maybe than their uh, electric bill that some people just pay automatically and don't even Mm -hmm. may not open them so um, we have flyers and posters at, around the town uh, library the center of active living uh, and that's ongoing if you walk around this building they're all over the place um, here's an example of um, a flyer on the right hand side there um, the nice QR code to scan and go right to the to the site um, the website uh, and email blast uh, was on July 11th um, there was a press release uh, and a story in Anchor on July 11th, um, and Jennifer at the Senior Center has been um, updating their newsletter, uh, and if you walk in there, there's uh, signage all over the place. Mm -hmm. um, and here's just some e examples of, of what that looked like. Um, and we are continuing to do uh, Facebook posts, um, Harbor Media, um, I think is re-airing their PSA. We did some last year that worked out really well. I know um, it's played at the Center of Active Living too on the screens continuously. Um, and that's done uh, now July through August. Uh, and tonight we are presenting to you and hopefully we get the word out a little bit more. Um, we had scheduled a uh, presentation like we did last year at the, the Center of Active Living. Uh, we didn't have a really any turnout. So I think, you know, one of the things that we need to look at going forward is we may have hit our mass sort of group mm -hmm. and now it may just be really getting into the nuts and bolts of it and going out and hitting the pavement and, you know, asking neighbors and asking um, a different demographic to be aware of this so they can kind of put it out there as well. Uh, either friends or relatives may have parents in town um, you know, I know in, you know, my neighborhood alone, there are probably three or four potentially folks who, who could benefit from this. And I know it's kind of a hard topic to, to approach with people, but, um, we'll see where the numbers are this year. And, and we may have to kind of figure out our next steps for, for marketing and, and outreach. Um, cause I don't know if we're going to see another 300% increase this year, yeah. but, um, yeah. so that's where we are with that. Okay. Uh, and then this last slide shows um, some of the other tax relief resources we have in the assessor's office. Uh, so if people come in and they don't qualify for the circuit breaker, um, we, the office will assist you to see if you qualify for any of these other exemptions. Um, 
And one of the things worth noting is that if you do qualify for one of these and the circuit breaker, you can qualify for two. Mm -hmm. So it could be substantial relief for a lot of people. Um, another thing is number five on this list is our elderly and disabled taxation fund, which is funded by taxpayers' contributions. Um, it has been inactive because the funds were depleted and we're um, reigniting it at this point. Um, it's, there's information on the website. We've started the committee. We've met and we have applications available to the public. Um, and another thing worth noting as well is at our last town meeting, um, the, an article was put forth to basically double a lot of these exemptions. So these used to be half what you're seeing here. Um, so just uh, $1,000 and $390 and now we've um, been able to double those. So great. that's a great relief as well. Excellent. And then, um, yeah, if anybody has any questions at all, our office is always open. Um, they, everybody's very, very knowledgeable, very friendly, and happy to assist. Excellent. Well, thank you. Um, this has been a tremendous program, um, and the outreach um, and people you've been able to, to reach and, and receive this benefit has been phenomenal. Um, I think I share your concern, Josh, about if we can reach all of the others and, and you know, if that 350 is, is really a realistic number or an accurate number, um, that certainly was an estimate, you know, based on kind of our initial demographic information. But um, I don't know if there's a way that we can hone in on that. I know it's hard because all the information is so um, confidential. We just don't yeah. know who, and right. rightfully so, we, right. we don't know. Um, so we're trying to figure out a way to, to do it. Um, you know, we talk a lot in our meetings about, you know, we have a lot of generational folks in town, and so maybe it's time to to reach the, you know, maybe the 40 to 55-year-olds who have parents mm -hmm. who still live and own in town yeah. who may not even pay attention to this stuff because it's, you know, we talk about senior means or exemptions, um, to educate them a little bit and figure out how to educate them to talk to their parents parents or mm -hmm. relatives or neighbors about this and so you know that's something we may look at figuring out what to do to hit those demographics yeah. next year okay um, other than that without really getting you know we can figure out based upon assessments who would qualify assessments and age mm -hmm. and some of the the qualifiers like we did with the mailing last year which okay. was really helpful mm -hmm. we thought maybe in every other year approach because it was a lot of work mm -hmm. to, to do that um, but we can possibly look at um, we can do some cross-referencing to see who we already mailed and if there's any new folks okay. or um, you know maybe hitting a demographic of of the younger folks to get information yeah. out there but we can we we'll take a look at that Sort of in the off season. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's a great idea, especially because a lot of the information is online. So, right. Um, have we thought about reaching out to the houses of worship in town to share the information? Uh, I think we did that. We might have. Did a we do that last year? Yeah, I don't last remember. Year. With the flyers, the houses of worship, right. and the food pantry, oh, and maybe right. a few other places. But we can um, we can make sure we get some resources there this year too. Right. That's a good okay. Idea. Um, and the income requirement. Is that set by the state? It is, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And just an another thing that I'll um, will mention is that um, the maximum credit is twelve hundred dollars, and that's set by the state as well. And yes. so there are some folks because it, it might be a um, there's a sliding scale depending on some factors and some percentages. Mm -hmm. um, so the town only you can only get through Hingham what you got through the state. So there were some instances last year. Um, where, where the people didn't get the full 1200 but they still got you know a few hundred here a thousand here but it's whatever the state the max of the state is got it. so if you only got let's say 900 from the state we can't give you the full 11 yes so got it i just want to make a note of that because if you look at the numbers sometimes they they won't add up right okay joe do you have any questions uh just a comment and praise i think the um the communication the outreach has been great and putting it in their real estate tax bills is mm -hmm. absolutely the way to go. People do open those. 
um, and you're right about the, the light bill. Um, most people, it's, it's online, they, they don't even open the envelope. Right. So uh, I think that's great. Um, and you know, one of the things that I think you've done that I don't think you've talked about is not, the, not necessarily the outreach, but the content of the outreach, making it more understandable mm -hmm. so that people do understand when they get the message that they can go through the process and that it works. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you for doing that. I think it's been a success. Uh, we hope that is yeah. part of so, sort of the growth avenue is that once people, the 96 people, well, 86 people who were approved, right. talk about it mm -hmm. um, as much as they can with their friends to see that what it was a, yeah. Yes, you do have to collect all your financial information, but once it's done, it was a pretty painless process, and it's good to get a $1,200 tax credit every year. Right. And the best thing people can really do is is contact Erin and her team. Mm -hmm. If you look at this list, like as she pointed out, the senior means tested tax exemption can give you up to 1200 on top of something else on this list. We've doubled it through town meeting. We made a commitment to try to maximize these resources and spread the word when we put the override request forward in the spring. And now that that has passed and it's incorporated into people's bills, we just want to make sure that everyone knows that these resources are out there. And um, like you guys said, her team is extremely knowledgeable. And you may not think you qualify for something, but they can kind of walk you through everything that's available. Um, and point people to the right resources. Excellent. And we are trying to, to figure out new programs as well. Okay, great. Um, you know, <clears throat> we see some, uh, some applicants who, um, who, are, who are here for a very long time who uh, are, are very senior, um, and so we want to try to figure out some way, something that, that we can do that's, you know, working with either the state or the town to to say if you, you've been here for 65 years and you're 90 years old, you're, you know. You've paid your dues. Your, your tax debt <laughs> has been fulfilled. Right. Um, but again, th there's a lot of restrictions when it comes to the state. Um, right. With that stuff. So we are going down those avenues and seeing if there's anything else that we can, that we can propose or bring to okay. town meeting or, or that sort of stuff. So Excellent. just like the, the tax. Um, the new tax relief board yes mm -hmm. so great and i'm glad to hear that that's active i think we have one more person to appoint to that mm -hmm. um, great. um yeah i think we do i think there's an open seat so um and can people i donate um do they need to do it via their tax bill or how, how's the best way to donate to that fund we're still in process of um figuring that out but yes they can definitely do it through the tax bill and we're looking at different at different avenues to um, be able to donate okay great excellent any other questions oh, thank you okay any questions or comments from members of the public all right well thank you thanks for thank coming you. thanks thank for you. all your effort and the next deadline is September 1st right yes yeah. excellent thank you all right, next on the agenda is... Um, Are we going to do Petrucci's? I don't think he's here. They can come. We can reschedule them because she's it's not, not able urgent. to get anyone. Okay. All right, so we will push the um, the approval of the request of Bertucci's for a change of manager to our next meeting. We are also pushing um, the renewal of um, VFIS ANS insurance proposal and claims as administration for public safety officer injuries on duty to another meeting. Next on the agenda are appointments. I don't believe we have any this evening. We are still actively working on that. Um, and we are still accepting talent bank applications if people are interested. Uh, next on the agenda is public comment. Are there any questions or comments from members of the public? Okay, seeing none. Next are town administrator and select board reports. Michelle, do you want to go first? I have one. Um, Tom and I wanted to congratulate our town accountant, Sue Nickerson, and her team for earning the GFOA's Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting. This is for the FY22 um, Annual Comprehensive Financial Report. This is the 27th year in a row that her team has earned this for the town. So Excellent. thank you, Sue. We yes. appreciate it. Excellent. Congrats. Thank you for sharing that. Tom? Sure, just a couple of uh, um, one-day liquor licenses to report. So this past, um, since the last meeting, I've approved one-day liquor licenses for Barrel House Z um, for an event tonight at Sunset Picnics at Weir Farm, uh, the Weir River Farm. Uh, Tuesday, uh, tonight, 
it's from 7 to 9 p.m. Uh, there was not a detail required. Okay. We're also, I also approved a one night for tomorrow, uh, one day for tomorrow night. Um, from 6 to 8 p.m., Hingham Maritime Center is holding their parent, their parent and adult uh, participation night. Uh, again, a police detail was not required. Okay. And Bre uh, I've also approved an, a one day for uh, Thursday, August 17th for Break Rock Brewing, LLC. Uh, again, sunset, sunset picnics at Weir River Farm from 5 to 9. And again, no police detail was required. I also, just so everyone knows, I've um, because of the rain, uh, the rain out for the um, the summer sidewalk sales. Uh, I I didn't bring it back to you because you guys had already evaluated the the program. But I've approved the new date of July, no August nineteenth. Sorry, August nineteenth. Perfect. Great. And that's again for anyone who knows for who wants to know noon to five on August nineteenth. Excellent. Downtown. Joe. Yes, so I do have uh, one item to report, uh, which is to recognize that yesterday, July 31st, in 2020, we closed on uh, the acquisition of the water company, um, which was an incredible feat for the town, an acknowledgement of our persistence and a recognition of the vision that we wanted to own the water company. And it came to fruition, so this is the third anniversary, um, and I just want to give you a brief update. Um, the town had goals, and the reason why we uh, acquired the water company, one was to deal with unaccounted for water. Um, to give you an idea, in 2019, unaccounted water accounted for about 24%. In 2022, that was down to 18%. So that's a six percentage point reduction, but in actual, that's a 25% reduction, which is huge. Um, that's 72 million gallons of water saved. Um, we've had leak detection programs. We're the town has very, been very active. Um, rates have been stabilized. Uh, rates were increased on July 1st, 2021. There was no increase in 2022, no increase in 2023. Uh, our PFAS levels are well below the state um, requirements. Uh, so we've, we've got a lot to be proud of there. All three years, the town, uh, the, the water company has been within its budget. Um, the Citizens Advisory Board has been active, and it was formed with members for, from all three towns, uh, Hingham, Hull, and Cohasset. Uh, there really has been improved communications between the town departments and the water system. Um, the Mass DEP Drinking Water Awards, Drinking Water Awards, were awarded in 2020 and 2022 to the Hingham, uh, to our water company, um, which was a real recognition. And the Mass DEP Operator Excellence Award in 2022 was awarded to Darren Durth. Uh, Liz and I were there to congratulate him. Um, he was proud and we were proud. Um, and um, it's a real recognition of the excellence of our team. Um, and it really is a team effort. Um, other highlights. Um, uh, there's, there's so many things that have happened. Um, there's been over 17,000 linear feet of water main replaced, added, or upgraded. Uh, 36 additional fire hydrants added to the system. Uh, there were 89 inoperable fire hydrants that have been replaced. Uh, there's a new storage tank um, designed for the strawberry for Strawberry Hill and Hull. Um, there's a 10-year capital plan created and is being implemented. Uh, we've had filters, uh, for new media for filter systems have been installed and new media has been installed. We've had one centrifuge replaced with a new high efficiency model, a second centrifuge ordered and expected to be delivered in late 2024. Um, contracts have been signed to replace the remaining three filter under drains. Um, we have new energy efficient boilers that have been installed. Uh, customer service has really been through the roof. Um, the comments that I've personally received uh, and I know that Russ has received, Liz, you've probably received, has just been stellar. Mm -hmm. So uh, really our congratulations to the team for making this happen and we look forward to future successful years. Excellent, thank you, Joe, for sharing all of that. Um, certainly we have a lot to be proud of and the entire team um, at Weir River Water System under Russ Tierney's leadership have, have done a tremendous job. Um, and it was, um, it's always interesting for me 
and rewarding to see the commitments that were made years ago with, with the vision of acquiring the water system, that, that we are meeting those, um, mainly the capital improvements, the, the stabilization of the rates, as well as the quality of the water. So um, there is certainly a lot to celebrate and, and be proud of, so thank you. Um, I just want to reiterate, um, Keith German brought it up earlier, but tonight is National Night Out. Um, the Hingham Police Department is sponsoring out on the field behind Town Hall. Um, I believe the movie is Super Mario Brothers. I think there's probably still time to get over there. Um, and, and all are, are certainly welcome. Um, and that's it. Any, anything else? No? I will the next meeting is two weeks. Yes, the next meeting is in two weeks, so August 15th. I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. A second. Roll call vote. Joe? Aye. And I'm an I as well. We are adjourned at 7.36 p.m. Thank, Thank you. you.